under the Copper Dome on uh, Missoula Community Access Television. Uh, it's a live uh, broadcast tonight. Uh, we have a couple of uh, stimulating guests, including a third one who will be over the phone at half past nine. Uh, so if you're interested in hearing from Russell Hill, um, who's uh, with the Montana Trial Lawyers Association, someone whom I don't know personally, but I've heard some of his commentaries over KUFM Public Radio, um, and I've read some of, you know, read about his work, uh, and so I thought, well, he sounds like an interesting person to talk to. So he's going to, uh, if all goes well, he'll call in at 9.30. And uh, I'm glad, too, that we've got a studio audience, and it's uh, none other but uh, KUFM Public's radio capital correspondent, so it's perfect. We're not under the Copper Dome, actually, but um, that's the name of the show, and sometimes uh, we are under the Copper Dome. We go up and do interviews and, you know, try and uh, make, a, uh, make something out of all this mess, and I'll call it a mess. Uh, some folks are calling it, you know... Uh, you know, this legislature a real disaster and, and a real right-wing takeover and uh, run by zealots and things like that. Um, let me introduce my guest uh, first. And uh, uh, first is Janet Robidoux. And uh, Janet is with the Indian Chapter Project of Montana People's Action. She's also on the board of directors of the Montana Women's Lobby. And um, tell me our, your, your third, uh, your Missoula Indian Center. Right. right. And uh, Janet is from Lame Deer, uh, Northern Cheyenne, and uh, it's Lame Deer, Montana. And uh, uh, it's funny, I just want to say this, you know, one, uh, uh, Janet, you and I re-met again up in Great Falls at a conference mm -hmm. back in the fall at some time. And I remember... At a meeting prior to that, I forget what it was. Maybe it was even uh, that day, and I said, well, I, you know, I feel strange. I said, uh, in Montana, you know, here I am. Uh, I think that I'm a progressive person, try to, you know, know people and get to know people. And I said, you know, I, I don't really feel like I have any, any Indian friends, you know, that when it came down to it. I, kn I know Indians, mm -hmm. and, you know, I like them, and I think they like mm -hmm. me, but I didn't have any friends. And then, when I went to that conference, when I ran into you, I ran into Indians that I met 18 years ago in, in, in Lame Deer, right? And, and, that, and that we had made a connection. It was significant. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, I did have Indian friends. So I didn't feel as, right. it was good. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, uh, plenty of people at that conference we were at talking about, uh, well, it was Indian people themselves that were saying they'd, it was the first conference in Montana they'd ever been to where so many Indian, mm -hmm. you know, people were there. You know, they weren't just the small little, uh, you know, patch-up group. Mm -hmm. um, I want to come back to you, Janet, uh, mm -hmm. and introduce uh, Derek Burney, who's with Montana People's Action. And Derek, I want to talk to you about the legislature itself because you've been up there in the trenches. You've been lobbying, and you've been lobbying and educating, I assume, primarily about housing matters. Uh, That's right. You know, give us a shot. It, you know, it seems pretty bloody and hard up there. Yeah, it's it's been really tough. A lot of uh, a lot of the votes haven't gone our way on on housing issues, um, both in the House and the Senate. And a lot of people that are up there working on progressive issues have found have had the same experience. So well, name one housing issue. What what do you call a housing issue? Well, you know the the program that we're working on. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose we, we you, you can talk about us having three primary aims. Us um, meaning Montana People's Montana Action. Montana People's Action. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of which is to increase the rights for a mobile home court resident. Residents, um, a significant number of people in the state live in mobile home courts, and so we had four bills this session actually that would have that provided right. additional rights for residents in right. mobile home courts. And uh, they're so going nowhere. They've gone nowhere. And, right. and uh, I, I, I t reading today's paper, you know, in, in, in the Missouli and about the the uh, you know the latest. I mean, I've been reading about trailer park problems uh, for years mm -hmm. and years and years. And I thought, and I think to myself, well, wait a minute, what is going on in this place? If after all these years of, 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 of you know, uh, you know, people, and it, it certainly, I mean, you read enough of how grisly it is. I mean, how okay. bad it really is for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, I, that I'm just, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I, I just picked up the paper and said, what? I said, what? So what's, what's, what's the big deal? I mean, why can't we straighten it? Well, um. 
we, we got a lot of interesting testimony uh, on some of these bills in the legislature, and so I think that even though we haven't gotten bills passed, we've actually educated a lot of legislators to the key fact that there's a there there's an inherent conflict in the mobile home courts between two property owners, mm -hmm. the owner of the property that that is the mobile home court itself, right. and then the homeowner. Most people own the home. Uh, and rent the space that right. it's on. So uh, it's not a typical uh, renter situation uh -huh. where the landlord has kind of the only vested property rights. The the homeowner also has a has well, rights why, as well. Well, why, so. why, why it, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, why mm -hmm. would the owners of mobile home parks or whatever be mm -hmm. so powerful in any legislature that they're able to, you know, prevent improvements? Mm -hmm. Well, this particular legislature, um, I think that um, you've, we've heard the same message from a lot of other uh -huh. groups, including a lot of the folks that were uh, doing this rally in, in Helena on Wednesday, and that this legislature seems to have uh, a big ear towards the rights of business owners and industry, right. and a very small ear towards the rights of uh, individuals in the state and the environment. Um, and it, so it's, I think, a philosophical bent mm -hmm. on the on the part of mm -hmm. many of the legislators, mm -hmm. not to mention just the you know the ability to mm -hmm. o you know mm -hmm. overpower us in terms of having a presence it's there. Well, so. well, Janet, maybe you could comment on this. Uh, um, I wonder, culturally speaking, that if you know now, late, I mean, more and more people are using the term, you know, tra oh, they're trailer people, you know, they're trailer trash. Whether whether it's Missoula, Montana, or you know, New York, New York, or whatever, you know, they're trailer people. You know, and that seems to me, if, if, we, if we develop this cultural mindset, then there's not much of an impetus, you know, in, in, on the part of the whole society, or a good part of it, to say, you know, you know maybe, uh, maybe I wouldn't be trash if I had a decent place to live, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I, 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 so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just real disappointed. I mean, I know MPA has done you know, d done some hard work over the years on these tra trailer park issues, and I just, I, I, like I say, it's, I, it must be frustrating not to... Is, it, tell me, is there any, in your knowledge, like uh, when you're a renter, mm -hmm. do the renters, do you ever talk to them about getting motivated and buying out the land that they're... Or is that a complicated thing for people? Do you want to talk a little bit about Covered Wagon and Bridge Review in Bozeman, or...? Oh, I'm not that. that. Why don't you go okay. ahead? Yeah. Well, we, um, you know, we have chapters across the state, and uh, in Bozeman, there are two mobile home courts that have organized a common residence association, Covered Wagon and Bridger View. Uh, and uh, in that court, over the past couple of years, we've had some of the most bitter battles over rules and regulations, mm -hmm. rent increases, management practices. Um, you know, all of the conflicts that you end up with in courts. Mm -hmm. Some of the most bitter fights in Montana have been in those two courts with mm -hmm. the owner, Dave Rauscher. The residents recently found out that he has those courts posted for sale. Mm -hmm. And so for the past five months, they've been working really hard to uh, locate sources of funding mm -hmm. through home and CDBG grants mm -hmm. and through assistance from the city and mm -hmm. county and other places to kind of put together a financing package to mm -hmm. um, buy their mobile home courts from their owner and mm -hmm. establish a cooperatively owned right. resident managed mobile home court. Right. We don't right. have a single co-op in the state, right. housing co-op in the state of Montana. So Is the National so Consumer Cooperative so Bank still alive, however modestly? You know, I'm not too familiar with, okay. with that organization. Janet, yeah. we'll what are you doing? What are you excited about these days? Well, uh, within the realm of Montana People's Action, we formed the Indian Chapter Project, right. which focuses and organizes urban Indian people in urban settings. And one of the issues that we as urban Indians um, have faced is that people can't differentiate mm -hmm. between reservations and, and urban issues. Mm -hmm. And um, the 1990 census says that there are 48,000 Indians living mm -hmm. in the state of Montana mm -hmm. on seven reservations. 40% mm -hmm. of that 48,000 Native Americans live in urban settings like Missoula, Butte, okay. Bozeman, Billings. You I know. mean, they may be, they be uh, enrolled members, uh, but they would... Right, and we right. choose to right. live right. off right. of our reservations yeah. right. for a number of reasons. Right. Um, jobs, school, education for our right. kids better wages, mm -hmm. um, better access to, mm -hmm. to city type stuff, but 
um, we're very concerned about what's going on on our homelands, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is the issues regarding the environment and mm -hmm. gold mines and coal mines and, and everything. People coming in and try to take resources from our reservations. But we also have issues here mm -hmm. in the urban settings. Mm -hmm. um, housing, affordable housing is mm -hmm. one of those. We have a number of Native Americans that live in mobile home parks right. and are unable to have the rights that any other homeowner that lives in a stick house mm -hmm. has. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't have the same rights because they're living in mm -hmm. mobile homes. We're also dealing with issues regarding um, education, specifically the uh, District 1 school system here in Missoula, which has a tendency okay. to not treat our Indian children on an equal footing as they do non-Indian children. How does that happen? Well, for instance, you have an Indian and a non-Indian uh, student that gets into a confrontation, whatever, male and female, in, in the school setting, and nine times out of ten, the Indian student will either be suspended or expelled from the mm -hmm. school system. Mm -hmm. The school okay, system is... Okay, I remember is, you talking right, about this in Great Falls. And mm -hmm. they're less likely to work with, with uh, Native American parents mm -hmm. than they are with, with non-Indian parents. And mm -hmm. so we want our, our children to be just as educated as anyone else, but okay. we also want them okay. to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. And so one of the issues that, that the Indian Chapter Project is... is um, mm -hmm. working on also with uh, uh, the advocates for social justice is how our children are being treated okay. in the school system. We also have issues regarding police brutality mm -hmm. against um, Native American folks that are picked up mm -hmm. by the okay. by the police. Wait, I mean, what, I, I, what, what happens when somebody uh, or hypothetically or whatever say, oh, people are always talking about police brutality. I mean, you know, they say, Missoula, Montana? Well, you know, you know, I had a conversation with Dan Chemist, and when he said that um, that the police were great in Missoula, yeah. and but if you talk to Native Americans, they they don't agree with that, mm -hmm. and we're not saying all we're trying to do is work together with where there's with smoke, there's fires. Exactly. I mean, you, in other words, years ago, uh, if blacks talked about police brutality, most of us said. Well, maybe the cops wrap them up once in a while, but you know, mm -hmm. and, you know. And then we, f then years go by, years go by, and you find out that there is, yeah. in fact, an endemic pattern uh, of abuse. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm willing to, you know, mm -hmm. tune in. Right. I'm willing to tune in, um, and I think more people should. Uh, I wanted to ask you. I mean, something that we talked about earlier today. Um, I'm very disappointed that, uh, as a citizen, that if I go to Helena. Or if I go to you know some branch office of state government or county government, uh, I don't see any Indians in, in, in or I haven't seen any. Maybe there's a, sure a few around that you know of, but I don't see Indians in positions of 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 of, of you know policy making authority. Not only you know just good jobs or a decent job that somebody wants, whether that's but but where are they in policy making? Oh. The new governor is elected. You know, he they find someone from one of the reservations or the cities to be his Indian Affairs coordinator, mm -hmm. and that's it. Right. And uh, uh, I understand there's uh, four Native Americans in the legislature this year, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, three Dems and one Republican or something Chase like that. Chase Stovall. Um, but 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 uh, that disappoints me. I think well, then of course you're going to contribute to an ongoing l lack of ethos if. Indian people or other minorities are not visible, saying uh, as bosses, as 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 policy makers, and in, in, you know, can you talk to that a little bit? Well, and that's one of our concerns also. There's an estimated five thousand Native Americans right here in Missoula. We're basically invisible people. Right. We're the invisible minority. Mm -hmm. We don't sit on the city council. We don't. We don't sit on county commission. Mm -hmm. We're not asked mm -hmm. to run for election. Mm -hmm. um, we do. We do have more success in the state legislature than we do on the local levels. Mm -hmm. That's another issue that we have a real concern about in the Indian Chapter Project. And so we want to be in these positions, but we get a lot of people who say, you know, we need to have more Indian people in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And yet when we put our names out there and say, mm -hmm. I'm willing to run for office, we don't get the backing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Basically, what we're asking people to do is put your money where your mouth is, mm -hmm. and if that's in indeed what you do want, then work with us. Mm -hmm. We're not 
trying to, all we're trying to do is be a part of. We live here. The, the Indian people that I have talked with, that I've known for years and, and have interviewed for the Indian Chapter Project, have been here 15, 16, 18, 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right. Where are they? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I look at, I, 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 uh, if I take uh, an example of the, uh, well, let's look at the media. Now, d refresh me, if you will. Who was the, who was the pretty, uh, pretty good TV reporter who uh, worked out of Billings for years? Ron was an Indian man. Oh, I know who you mean. I can't remember his Okay, but I mean, he, he, yeah. he worked for network, uh, Montana Network Television, oh. I think, MTN, out of Billings. Ron, uh, it'll come to him. Ron was his first name. And he's gone on, I think he, you know, went to work in Washington like a lot of it. But he did do good programming. He did some interesting, you know, little, uh, mm -hmm. you know, t did a weekly show, plus was a regular newscaster. Um, you know, whether, I mean, I'm sure he had his critics and his, but, but, but he was, he stood out because he was the only Indian newscaster uh, that, at least at that time, of, of, of maturity, of, of some depth. Uh, who took on, you know, serious topics mm -hmm. and had, you know, a weekly public affairs program, right? That, that, that was, you know, mm -hmm. just didn't go down to the res. It went to, you know, the city of Billings and mm -hmm. the rest. And to this day, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I see a lot of young people working as n newscasters, uh, and I know locally uh, and around Montana generally they're poorly paid in any event, uh, you know, mm -hmm. white, black, yellow, red, or brown. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's hard work, um, and but I do not see, I do not see, you know, a, s a serious work being done by the commercial stations. Um, it, it, let's say, I mean, how often do you have the opportunity on a regular basis, on a prime time basis, to get on local commercial television? You know, you know, it's impossible because they got to run the stuff from New York or whatever. But could they make room for it? And where is that training program for Native Americans? And where is that weekly Native American show? But that's me uh, speaking of that issue. I've spoken to before. I think it's very significant because if, if, if people, if, 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 like you say, if we're invisible, if, you, if, if Indian people in Missoula are generally invisible, how do, you get in, how do you get visibility? Why are we here? Why am I here? Because I think people need visibility. They need an opportunity to speak for themselves. So I think the media and its place in, in, in the culture is important uh, for information primarily, for mm -hmm. entertainment as well. Um, what, d, what, d, being in the legislature, mm -hmm. I, 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 lobbying, I mean, let me give you an impression just from, let's say, I've come up, gone up a few times. I used sure. to go up a lot, you know, 15 years ago. Now I'm too old. It's too tiring. It's your job. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's uh, tiring. But uh, it, it's an exhausting job. But... Mm -hmm. uh, I found, and I was going to, I, I hope when Russ calls, I told him and I wanted to talk about this, about uh, legislative restructuring. I testified on one bill, or tried to, uh -huh. right? And I felt very, you know, first of all, it's, I'm talking now about public participation. Right. These rooms are tiny, they're, uh, you know, that you have to go and, squ and squash in on. Uh, wow. There's a lot of important lobbyist looking ty type people in suits, Ties mostly men, suits. right? Yeah, ever, you know, ones. there does mm. not seem to be a comfortable place for the citizen lobbyist or for, you know, the, uh, someone who's not working for a big company and, and making big bucks to do it. Mm -hmm. So, so I, 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 could you talk a little bit about the, about the working environment and how it could be improved to the benefit of the citizenry? Could you? Well, it's, it's been difficult for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I wasn't there last session, so I can't really comment on the difference. But mm -hmm. what, I, what I've heard from people who've been there at both sessions was that last session it was very difficult for kind of normal citizens to participate in the process, especially mm -hmm. if they uh, didn't have kind of the rightward leaning views that a lot of the legislature had. Uh, and the way people experienced it last time around was they got shouted down during mm -hmm. uh, hearings, they got gaveled out, they, uh, some of the new kind of uh, rightward leaning legislators would uh, make, you know, kind of wise cracks that, that would com completely delegitimize testimony from real people. And mm -hmm. um, what I think has happened is that, fo that those folks have become more sophisticated this time around. And you don't see the kind of outward um, 
uh, hostility towards normal people. But what they do do instead is that they do exactly what you said. They pack uh, huge hearings into the smallest rooms possible. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times they establish 20-minute limits for mm -hmm. uh, proponent mm -hmm. testimony when there might be 50 or 100 or mm -hmm. 150 or 200 people there to speak in favor of an issue. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they limit uh, people's ability to speak in that way. It's been really tough. The right to work uh, bill, when that got heard uh, a few weeks ago, there were over 200 people there uh, doing a rally kind of to, you know, oppose the right to work law. And they held it in one of the smallest hearing rooms possible. You could, there could only get about 40 or 50 people into that hearing room. Mm -hmm. um, what, as you look, you're on a little three-day break here, four days, or? Yeah, transmittal uh, deadline was Wednesday, so the, both houses wrapped up their business, er, I guess, early on, about 9 o'clock. And yesterday. a little civics lesson here. Mm -hmm. This means that at this juncture, all bills, explain, explain that. Well, you know. bills go through first one house and right. then the other, Senate, right. House, or likewise. Right. And uh, if they haven't made it through the house in which they originated by Wednesday. If they haven't been tossed, if, they, if, if I'm sitting in the house, if I haven't passed the law over to the Senate, then forget it's it. Dead. It's done for. That's even right. If, even, That's know. for most bills. There are a few right. bills that, uh, you know, appropriations bills and some other things. In other words, now we get down to money, right? That's I mean, right. Ba the next uh, part of it. Is mm -hmm. this going to get bloody? I mean, what's what? Uh, what uh, the yeah, governor says uh, there's X. Uh, there, there are lots of different, uh, different projections from uh, you know budgets coming from the House and Senate, and then from the governor. That I think there's a coming uh, battle over tapping the coal tax fund. Mm -hmm. um, our one remain, you know, the one remaining bill that we have that we went into into the legislature with is an appropriation bill that would set up a housing trust fund to build more affordable housing and help families get into affordable homes. So that remains to be decided. That's on. a lot. Um, that's still alive, yep, and it'll uh, it'll be heard in House appropriations sometime in the next week or two. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, let's see. So we've got uh, we've got how many days left in the legislature, more or less? Uh, Boy, uh, you know, about two months. Two months. Yeah. Another. So it's mm -hmm. it's going to be it's still going to be a grind, mm -hmm. right? And do you when when you work with folks in Missoula in your job? Do, do, does, do, are you able to make any, I mean, I don't know what all the things that you do in your daily job, right? But are, you, are, are, are the connections uh, to the legislature significant to you and the people that you work with? Or do, do you make an effort as a mentor, for example, to connect things together? Well, what I'm doing is organizing people to develop their own voice within their own local communities. Okay. And we as as women and as Native Americans are definitely watching Bill Baharsky's bill, um, House Bill 299 and 303, which okay. are the anti-affirmative action bills. And uh, as Derek was talking about earlier, at, at that particular hearing, there were three um, proponents, and we had over 70 opponents, and we didn't have enough time for everyone to speak. Mm -hmm. So we're just like shifted through. It's almost like they don't want to hear what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And um, when uh, Chief Old Person, Earl Old Person mm -hmm. spoke, right. he was very eloquent. And he said something that was very hard hitting in that he said that he has been coming to that legislature since 1954 mm -hmm. because they are continually trying to take away the rights of Indian people. But these two bills, it's not just Indian people, mm -hmm. it's also women. Mm -hmm. They want to go through the law books and just eliminate anything that has to do with minorities or women. Right. It's gender and race. Right. And well, what, 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 come on, let's be, what's going on here? I mean, are people frightened? Are, you know, are, they, are these people, um, are, are, I mean, is it ideology? Is it, is it religion? Is it... Are they frightened by this strict, fast-paced world that we all well, must confront? Well, I mean, what it means one of the things that bothers me the most about Bill Baharsky's bills is that he, his, his statement is that he wants to um, level the playing field. He wants us all yeah, on the right, level, playing level the field. playing field. And Representative Bill Whitehead said in the in the paper that that India, as Indian people, will continue to walk uphill on this level playing field, yeah. and so will women. And it, it, when Bill Baharsky says that in the eyes of God we're all created equal, mm -hmm. that's true. 
we are all equal in the eyes of God. He doesn't see color. He doesn't see gender. Okay. But God is not making the laws. Mm -hmm. These men and, and women in Helena are. Mm -hmm. And for them to just arbitrarily throw our rights out the door, mm -hmm. is it's very scary. And I'll so that's that. what we're organizing people around because we want them to know that uh -huh. we're watching what's going on. Mm -hmm. And as Indian people mm -hmm. and as women, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very scary for us to, to face the fact that... that you know, I, I got a job at the State Highway Department, and I know it was because I was a Native American and I'm, I'm a female. Right. Because they didn't want me in there. I have a friend who got a job with the railroad mm -hmm. who got in because she's female. Right. Now, what's going to happen is that employers will have no, will suffer yeah. no repercussion mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And you don't see Indian people in jobs now, well, you're really not going to see mm -hmm. them. I think we're seeing a, a real trend for um, the you know what's coming out of one side of the of their mouths is is get government um, out mm -hmm. of our lives and so what they're doing is they're doing that they're pulling government out of business operations so uh, for example any effort for us to get additional rights out of the government for tenants mm -hmm. that would regulate the way that landlords or mm -hmm. other you know realtors and other mm -hmm. people in business operate mm -hmm. they say no way to that but mm -hmm. then on the other there's talking out of the other side of their mouth and saying we have no problem whatsoever kind of putting government into your personal private life mm -hmm. when it comes to who you want to get married to what kind of lifestyle you want to lead right. decisions that you might want to make about your own body mm -hmm. um, those kinds of decisions they have no problem putting government into that, into that part of your life. I'm just so. curious, now Boharsky is handicapped himself, right? Mm -hmm. And the only reason I bring that up is, is that when early on when he was proposing and he had his critics saying, well look, you benefited from laws and policies that, uh, that you know, made us sit up and notice that people needed ramps and so we spent a lot of money building ramps for folks who needed ramps. Mm -hmm. And um, but I haven't, has he made a justification of, of, of his posture in that regard? Have you, because uh, I never read one, and I was just curious what his response to that criticism was. You could probably speak more directly to that. I wasn't present at the hearing where he actually spoke directly to these bills. Did you but hear his testimony? The only thing he yeah. did say, you know, that, that I heard, and, and, you know, we all hear yeah. different things, is that he is trying to level the playing field and make, you know, we as Montanans are all equal. Yeah. And, and uh, I just, it, it doesn't make any sense to me when, when um, he's pointing specifically at women and minorities. You know, there are other mm. minorities in the state right. of Montana. Right. Um, and why we as women and minorities need to be singled out, mm -hmm. um, I don't understand, but his justification mm. is that... Um, uh, to level the playing mm -hmm. field and that uh, we don't need these types mm -hmm. of laws mm -hmm. in the state of mm -hmm. Montana. Uh, are either of you personally, I mean, this, I, I mean I'm curious, do you, I, some, when I was up in the legislature visiting a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago on a couple of different occasions, and uh, this was visceral, this was, I hadn't thought this out, but I saw some faces there that I first saw 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, they may be, uh, you know, likable people at maybe Rust Hill now. Uh, but I thought, isn't it time for some fresh faces? Um, I, I mean, it was just a reaction. I thought, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to see... I don't know. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to see new faces. I, w I, I thought, well, wait a minute, maybe... 18 years in, 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 a, in a governmental institution is, is, is long enough for, and if you have to make, I mean, that was just the reaction that I had. Uh -huh. I thought, you know, sometimes you need to turn, you know, turn the job over, you know. Um, so, so talk. is that Russell Hill? <laughs> Hello. 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 This is MCAT. Is this Russ? Oh, this is Okay. Uh, we're waiting for another call, excuse me. Or do you have a question or comment for... I'll call back. Okay. So you didn't want to talk to us. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. 
help me well, out. Well, I, I, you know, I agree. I think it, it would be good to see some new faces out there. Um, although it, it seems to me that um, some of the, it, 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 this is true in Congress and in the legislature both, that, that some of the kind of, you know, really zealous, People that some mm -hmm. folks might call zealots, you know, mm -hmm. that they they're getting they're getting in the positions of power, and they they have a mission mm -hmm. to kind of uh, you know facilitate mm -hmm. this the kind of the Republican mm -hmm. revolution. Some of those are the new faces that we're seeing, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that what we've seen is that you know we've seen a real strong presence by the Christian Coalition and the Eagle Forum up there. Mm -hmm. That's something that we, you know we haven't really talked about is mm -hmm. not only the the corporate influence and the business influence in the capital, but also the influence of you know real kind of uh, s strongly right wing um, grassroots groups like the Christian uh, Coalition as well. But you know we, when we saw the Republican Revolution in '93, a lot of freshman uh, senators and representatives got in there, and they really didn't care if they were going to get reelected at all. That mm -hmm. what they wanted to do was kind of uh, you know, push through their, their kind of moral agenda. And so I think what we've seen in a lot of cases in the Capitol, in terms of people talking out of both sides of their mouth, is, you know, what folks have called an unholy alliance of mm -hmm. corporate interests as well as, you know, kind of uh, right-wing grassroots organizations. Um, so I, I would like to see a lot more new faces in there, but I think they've got to come from mm -hmm. some from different directions, too, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, progressives have got a little bit of ground to catch up, you know, in terms of comparing to the Christian coalition and some of the grassroots groups. See, I, I wanted to return a little bit to politics and, and, and uh, Native Americans and their, uh, their absence in public life, you know, both men and women, Native American. And you had said something about how, for example, among other things, well, political parties don't reach out, you know, and say, and I have sometimes felt that looking at life in Missoula, you know, there, it, it seems like the, uh, the same old, y you never get a phone call saying, well, could you come down and talk about, uh, you know, would you like, you know, you know, I mean, talking about politics, right, and running for office and what have you. Um, Russell, who's on my Thank you. All right, let's, let's yeah. jump in here. Russell. Hi, McCarthy. All right, how you doing? Pretty good. Good. Well, we got uh, uh, Janet Robodeau here. Hi, Janet. Hi, Russell. And we've got Derek Burney. Hey, Russ. That was Derek Burney. Can you hear all right, Russell? I can. They're a little funny, but I sure can. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we've been covering the waterfront here. Uh, Russ, uh, can you give our viewers down here in Missoula just a little uh, a, a, a brief bio of yourself and what the trial lawyers, what you're doing up there with and for the trial lawyers, what it is you're trying to accomplish, what do you think have, have been your most frustrating uh, times, whether those are particular pieces of legislation or not, and uh, give us a little wrap here about what's going on for you there in Helena. Okay, a quick bio, the Texas accent has persisted since I moved to Montana in 1983. I'm an attorney, I've been with the Montana trial lawyers since 92, and before that, was an attorney with the Montana Department of Insurance, so that's real quick. Okay. Uh, you ask what I'm doing for the trial lawyers up at the, the Montana legislature. In a nutshell, I think we're getting our butts kicked like a lot of, I think, a lot of interest groups on the progressive side of the spectrum. I'll be honest, uh, you ask what it is we're trying to accomplish up there. Uh, the fact is, we're not moving many votes, and we knew that going in, but we have decided that it's very important just to say for the record and uh, for anybody who will listen uh, what some of the problems are with the legislation, how they impact real people, and basically trying very hard with some success uh, to call a spade a spade and, and talk about a legislature that's really uh, operating on a double standard in terms of individuals versus commercial interest. Uh, Russ, uh, uh, let me just clear the air on this because uh, the tri uh, uh, as we talked earlier today, uh, you know, the trial lawyers nationally and to a certain extent in, in, in any state uh, uh, will sometimes draw down uh, the wrath and say, oh, the trial lawyers, uh, they're just interested in uh, you know, feathering their own nests, make sure that there's enough loopholes in the laws so that they'll always have a, you know, decent living wage and, um, 
so could you comment on that and, 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 and if you have a different explanation of what the trial, you know, what, 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 how the trial lawyers and you think you're trying to help the folks of Montana, give us a shot, please. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thanks for the question, McCarthy. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that uh, the Montana trial lawyers historically, this is now my third session to lobby, we have opposed a heck of a lot more legislation. Uh, we have rarely uh, introduced or supported legislation, and so, uh, you know, uh, I think a superficial reading of that is that we're obstructionists. The fact is, I don't have any problem at all opposing uh, law after law, because even the 95 legislature, as conservative as it was, uh, lengthened Montana statutes by, by more than 400 pages, and we're on uh, a pace in this session to do even more. To, you know, it's not an issue of conservative versus liberal as much as it is institutional. You get legislators in there that think to do their job, they have to pass new laws. Well, the fact is, for the common person out there, it's already such a, uh, you know, we hear a lot of conspiracy theories in this session where it's a conspiracy of complexity uh, that's out there. People just can't navigate all those laws. And you bet, lawyers uh, become more and more essential as, uh, as Montana's laws and rules and regulations be become more complex. We are not in favor of that complexity. What the Montana trial lawyers essentially uh, advocate is a simplicity of law and trusting juries, trusting uh, 12 common Montanans to look at the infinity of fact situations that occur and, can de and decide who, who was at fault and who wasn't at fault. And juries, juries aren't uh, throwing away money. They're very stingy these days, but it seems to me that trusting a jury in the long run is much more efficient than having, you know, a, a, a code and regulations that you can't even fit in one room. It's so large. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about trial lawyers feathering their nest, and I, I never fail to get satisfaction out of hearing business interests who constantly uh, talk about the importance of the entrepreneurial spirit and the profit motive somehow thinking that when it comes to representing people injured by, by businesses, it ought to be, uh, you know, nearly pro bono work and nearly shouldn't be compensated. Our American society and most advanced societies for, for generations have decided that it's so important to protect people who are devastated or killed uh, by the fault of others that we're going to we're going to make that pay for attorneys that do that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed at all to represent attorneys who only get paid when they win a case. They're not hourly fee attorneys. They, they, don't, they have no uh, incentive to drag out litigation. They only get paid if they win for their client. Let me, this is really a question for all of you, but of course uh, we're, uh, we're, on, we're on Russ's uh, nickel here. He called in from Helena. Thanks very much. <laughs> but, um, you know, all of my years in Montana, I, I, you never hear about any money corruption. You know, like that, that the state has such little money as a state that we're as clean as a whistle. And I, I, I keep, you know, as, as a reporter, I keep waiting for some investigation. Gative reporter to you know I mean um, uh, I wonder I mean I don't, I don't know do you folks pick up anything in the legislature about uh, you know uh, uh, you know Vicky Cacciarella was talking to me a couple of weeks ago on 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 tape that we uh, ran here on um, under the Copper Dome and. Uh, uh, you know, she referred to, you know, you know, really, really high paid lobbyists, you know, that, that, uh, that are, that, that, that seem to be running the show. Um, McCarthy, let me jump in. Okay, uh, yeah, please. I think that is a, a real problem. And when you say corruption, a lot of people think unless you have a conviction for a bribe or something improper, there's no corruption. In preparation for the show, I just looked through some uh, reports by the Commissioner of Political Practices. There's yeah. 500, by my count, 597 lobbyists registered this session. That's four lobbyists for every legislator. And somebody like the 7 Up Pete Joint Venture has 12 registered lobbyists. Montana Power has eight. Uh, Department of Corrections has 17. U.S. West has six. When you get a system that's so complicated that no individual, no, not even the most honest 
right. And that, that's just right. the fact of the legislature, and I think that is corruption. Well, I, uh, uh, thanks, Russ. I, I mean, I, uh, I just spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, some extensive minutes over 18 months of uh, the so-called Governor's Blue Ribbon Telecommunications Task Force. And um, I, I, I mean, I was up 3 o'clock in the morning. I woke up 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, oh, I better read those reports. You know, I couldn't get back to sleep, you know. Well, the reports did not edify me. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think I'm, you know, I mean, I, I studied reading, and I, I know I, I'm a pretty good reader. I didn't know what they did over 18 months. It, it was just, it was, and, it, and it was shocking to me. And it was also shocking to me that, that, that a lot of the people that were appointed uh, to sit on that governor's Blue Ribbon Telecommunications Task Force, which the last legislature set up as a law, right? I mean, it became... You know, this was a law that set up the task force. And then, uh, you know, in my qu investigative queries in writing to the various departments concerned, uh, my question was, um, well, how was, who started soliciting industry for the contributions that were listed in the reports? In other words, in other words uh, there was some kind of soft sell in which, uh, you know, uh, I have the list here someplace, but various phone companies, small and large, donated, quote, mm -hmm. X thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. like, in one, you know, $35,000, right. $20,000. Right. So, I, I mean, I kept, I kept asking the question in Helena. Uh, I, I said, well, how did, how did this all come to be? You passed the law, and, I mean, how does it work? And then industry is supposed to cough? to sit on the task force that the governor appointed to... D I mean, how can you get a, a, some decent legislation? I, I'm sorry, I'm ranting a little bit, but... <laughs> well, and let, let, me, let me tell you what the kind of... If I can, and I don't want to hog the no, you got, you got a few. you got a few minutes a left. 30 or 40 minutes of conversation. No, that's there. good. Let me tell you what happens uh, when you have a system like we've got. Let me just give you some bills. There's a bill that the House approved in the morning right before transmittal, House Bill 5. This has to do with corporate contributions uh, to the ballot initiative process. And you've got legislators who want to make Initiative 125 unconstitutional. They don't think there can be any restriction on corporate speech, which is contributions to political campaigns. And at the same time, that House is passing House Bill 453, an obscenity bill, which radically restricts the free speech of artists and teachers and students on the basis of nudity. You know, you've got a double standard there for corporations and individuals. Mm -hmm. You've got, for the first time I know of anywhere, a bill that would propose for Montana's Constitution to make preferential treatment unconstitutional unless there's federal dollars mm -hmm. to be had for doing so, or unless it makes good business mm -hmm. sense. You really get mm -hmm. a, a Well, yeah, I, I, I just uh, hang in there with us. I, I want to do two things. I want to, uh, and I had said earlier, by the way, to, to my guest that um, as a vet, I'm a little bit embarrassed because while I, I haven't, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as a veteran, I haven't used my preference, my Montana built into law preference, right, for a job or whatever. I have not, but I always like to have it in my pocket. Because it's something that was extended to me, mm -hmm. but I'm embarrassed. I said, "Well, what, if somebody else isn't going to get, you know, a little break, then how? how why should I get a break?" But look, uh, uh, Russ, hang in there with us, and what, I want to ask you this one question, and then I'll turn it over to Janet and Derek, and you guys can, you know, kind of hit him with a couple of questions or a couple of comments uh, about, and you know, and. Uh, How's that sound? Mm -hmm. And I just want to, what's, what's your worst fear for the, for, for the you know, the, 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 the next two months? I mean, what, 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 what do you see on the horizon? I mean, how can, how, is there anything that can be redeemed here, Russ? Well, I think the only hope of redeeming something is just to, to squeal loud uh, and, and not become, you know, I think, I think unorganized people and common people are the path of least resistance that this legislature is going to run over, and the more noise you can make, uh, the more resistance you can offer, maybe the less that happens. I'm not real hopeful. Uh, personally, and from a fairly, uh, you know, peculiar standpoint, my biggest fear of this 
this legislature is what I see happening is a legislature that is genuinely attracted to passing defective laws so they can dump them in the lap of the Montana Supreme Court and essentially uh, precipitate, I, I don't want to over, mm -hmm. you know, overstate the case about a constitutional crisis, but there's a sense in the legislature that there's only three branches of government they want to be in control, and the Constitution is is kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so I see bill after bill that legislators know is unconstitutional, and never, nevertheless they pass it. And I think that's a that's a real threat to a system of government that served us very, very well. Okay, Russ, uh, hang in there, and uh, and and now we'll uh, have you to uh, jump in, uh, Russ. I just want to uh, ask you, w would you please uh, t uh, tell everybody how much you appreciate the tie I'm wearing? <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, thank you. All right, <laughs> uh, carry on, please. With 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 okay. uh, Russ. Well, you know, I I I can't um, I can't disagree at all with what Russell is saying and I, I, I couldn't agree more um, it's it's a really uh, it's a scary legislature I'm nervous about what's going to happen over the next half of the session um, what personally just the way that I feel after the first session is that more than ever I'm kind of stoked up and angry about the the balance of power that um, exists or doesn't mm -hmm. exist in this state. And what I've been doing for the past two years and building up to the legislative session is organizing mm -hmm. on the ground, working to put together a group of people who are prepared to kind of present a united front and fight for their rights. And so even though um, I think we're going to come out of this legislative session with um, no additional rights for tenants um, and maybe even mm -hmm. some loss of some rights, what I'm most afraid of for the second half of the session is, th is that the rules of the game get changed and so that even now that I'm most fired up to get out there and organize, that there are additional obstacles put in our way. Um, an inability for us as a nonprofit organization to work on ballot initiatives, for example. Um, a lack of uh, assistance with the Human Rights Commission, which was you know, mm -hmm. one of the, the, the few um, places that tenants could go to if they felt like they were being discriminated against or in somehow in an unfair <coughs> situation. The legislature is dismantling their mission and pulling their money away. Um, you know, there's just, I think um, we, we're going to see potentially in, uh, some bills passed that will dramatically weaken the rights of tenants, not, not just fail to increase them, but weaken them. And so all of those things are potential obstacles for our work over the coming two years, uh, you know, getting ready to go back to the legislature and try to change the game. So um, I think that um, the next two months potentially can, you know, really change the rules of the game for us, and that could be really damaging. Jen. Well, and as a, a you know, Jane citizen mm -hmm. uh, from a local community, um, hi, Russ, good to hear you again. Good to uh, hear you, Jen. Um, what scares me the most is that um, I, I don't want there to be any apathy from our part as citizens. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a call to arms. Mm -hmm. This is a time when we need to get together and organize, and that's what we're doing at Montana People's Action and through the Indian Chapter Project is organize people to say, if we don't pull it together now, we're going to be in big trouble. And, and as I said, it, a call to arms and organize people and let legislators know that they have to be held accountable for the decisions that they're making in our behalf. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get health bills like 299, or House Bill 299 mm -hmm. and House Bill 303 and, and gutting the Human Rights Commission, um, where are our, our rights? Where are we going to go? And there are going to be court cases. You know, I, I just see an endless stream of court cases because people's rights are going to be violated, and we're, we have to fight. We have to fight back. Well, good. All right. <laughs> but, you know, it, you know, it strikes me, I mean, this is, again, a visceral reaction that, that now I'm looking at the legislature, and the legislature seems like the, the quote, uh, legal, formalized uh, end run of everything that we went through last year with, you know, or uh, that we still live with in Montana, you know, mm -hmm. militia and free men and, and, uh, uh, and what have you. A and yet, uh, I, the legislature... Uh, makes me more nervous than um, uh, than the militia has ever made me. 
Oh, because I mean, I can deal with the militia. I mean, I can go up and go up to Knoxon and you know and and uh, look around, and I'm not afraid to do that. I'm careful, but whatever, you know. But I, I I'm almost afraid of the legislature. I, I oh, I, 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 this is what I mean. There's no answer to this, uh, Russ. Uh, yeah. But I, I went up and I did. I, I took my turn to to, to testify on, on a particular bill. And I, I was very nervous, and people would usually say about me, well, I coil, and, you know, not assertive, you know, but anyway, I, I did, I, I, you know, crawl my way up, you know, and, you know, and get in there and stuff like that. And I, I didn't, I guess I didn't know what the rules are, because I had the bill in hand. I called up a couple of professionals that, to, it, it, you know, I wanted to know more about this thing. I knew something about it. And I started to suggest... You know, well, on line something something. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, this is a good bill. I said, but you know, it, ha you know, and uh, all of a sudden the chairman says, "Well, are you for it or are you against it?" You know, I mean, and and I was like, I was embarrassed. I mean, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I'm a professional person anyway. I mean, I mean, I'm supposed to be smart, you know, but I they scared me. You know, I mean, I I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I was just there as a citizen, trying to be helpful. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to trip anybody up. I, I was just trying to make a. I, 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 and the guy says, "Are you for it or against it?" And I, I shrugged my shoulders. There's an incredible. Uh, what I find an incredible arrogance. I, I saw a senator, uh, and this was not a bill that I was interested in. I didn't have a dog in this fight, but I saw uh, a public citizen testifying on a bill. Ask a senator a question. And the senator's response was, "I'm not. You're not here to ask me questions. I'm here to ask you questions." And my reaction, although not spoken, was, "Yes, sir, Mr. Elected Public Servant." You know mm -hmm. that that kind of arrogance translates from a personal level to an institutional level when you have no respect for the opposition viewpoint and you don't you don't make good decisions that way. You know, in the in the court system. You assume that the best, the truth comes out best if you let two sides contend very vigorously, each for its side. And that ought to be, in my opinion, to a great extent, what happens at the legislature. And this session, it's simply not. It, it ought to be, and, and I think what's happening is that people are sent... The message is out there that it is, though, Russell. I mean, if you read, for example, an article in this morning's Missoulian about uh, Governor Roscoe being kind of pleased with the mm -hmm. way the legislature is going, and he said exactly what you just said, Russell, is that, you know, that this, this system has a remarkable way of producing balanced results. And um, so, uh, you know, I think that we got to, Russell, you and I and other people got to keep getting it out there that it's not producing balanced results. Yeah. Well, I, uh, uh, his... <laughs> His, uh, a, a, a press person in Helena, or someone who is not in this room, but a press person I met in Helena, I know you're not supposed to say things like that, but it was funny, and they said, because I, I have referred, I have referred to the governor as, you know, St. Mark, uh, you know, and, when, and I talked to this other reporter in Helena in, in, in the Capitol building there, and that reporter said, well, other people say His Highness. Um, so, uh, but Vicki Cacciarella, uh, I, when I was interviewing her a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I, she was talking about, you know, that, that she, her concerns, a lot of education, children, uh, Head Start, uh, she didn't like, you know, all this prison construction and this rush to, you know, build more prisons and stuff like that, and she said, but the governor, she said, did come in with a good budget, right, I mean, good in the sense that, he had allowed, you know, you might not like every part of it, but that he had built a big budget, uh, you know, relatively speaking, and that, uh, you know, he, you know, seemed to be giving some leeway there for some of the matters, you know, like Head Start, that we think are, are, are good things to keep on going. But Vicky went on, I, I said, well, I said, is he lobbying his party? Because it didn't seem clear to me that he is, if he, it's she, when she said, she said, and her answer, uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, not too extended, but she said, uh -huh. you know, she uh -huh. said, referring to the governor, um, how do you get to be as popular as like 84% of the people love you? That you don't stick your neck out for something. And that, and that you, this is Cacciarella talking. 
She said, so, so no, she doesn't see him lobbying his party and saying, well, come on, uh, guys and gals, we, you know, uh, I, I, I wanted X dollars to, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, children or education or what have you. She said, that's how you get to be popular, by not, uh, by not uh, you know, at, at least obviously, uh, stepping on too many to toes. McCarthy, I, I think there's truth to that. I want to, I probably need to moderate a little. I want to tell you some of the most heroic things that I'm seeing at the legislature this session. Okay. You've got uh, about five yeah, minutes. It, it may be a little behind the scenes, but it's moderate conservatives who have seen the political center shift and all of a sudden find themselves in kind of an uncomfortable position of trying to uh, restrain some of the more radical right and radical conservatives. And I think the governor on several issues behind the scenes is exerting a fairly powerful moderating influence. I still disagree with much of what he's uh, going along with, but I think there is some, you know, there are some small heroisms occurring, and lots of them among conservatives who suddenly find themselves mm -hmm. uh, pulling in an opposite direction than they, than they have been. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's uh, it's time for not only both major parties, but uh, all minor parties to you know get get moving and, uh, and jump into the fray, join the party. Um, we got just a couple minutes left. Uh, uh, Russell, let me see. Was there anything else special we needed to ask Russell, or uh, or not? Or are we done with Russ? I just said, uh, you know, I heard a really great piece of testimony from Russell earlier on in the session. And I think what, you know, when I was asked earlier today, what's the most radical thing that, I've, that has come up in the session? And it was, uh, I, I, my answer was public spanking. Mm. Russell had a really great piece of testimony on that. Maybe you can repeat it for us, Russell. <laughs> Well, uh, my my board didn't find it as funny as apparently most other people did. Right? But basically, <laughs> when you say I was you're trying to drive home the difference, you know, a legislature that insists on personal responsibility and dismisses corporate responsibility. I thought since a corporation doesn't have bare buttocks, we ought to make sure that corporate officers have to drop their drawers just that's, like everybody else. That's right. Well, we uh, there were many people down here in Missoula, Russ, that said, well, could. Could this fella give us a demonstration, you know, in the legislature of just how he wanted to use that big Bertha uh, paddle with the nails in it or something? That would be great, you know. I mean, I can promise you, it uh, wouldn't be a pretty sight. <laughs> um, well, hang in there, Russ, and we'll. But I'll, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Janet and Derek, and uh, and and we'll be finishing up here in about uh, three minutes. Is that right? And uh, by the way, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Missoula Community Access Television. Uh, it's MCAT um, here in Missoula, Montana, and uh, with uh, over, gosh, I don't know, over 100 active producers, films and videotapes coming out of here uh, all the time. Um, we have students from the university now coming down and using the facility because they uh, can't find the equipment they need up there. But we're glad to have them. Um, so we're really proud of uh, our facility here, and I want to thank uh, an all-volunteer crew uh, always come through, Greg Beckley and Nancy Robustelli, and a uh, new friend who's directing the show, uh, Ken Coulson, and, uh, and then we got an MCAT staff person back there, Andy Thorgerson, and um, he's always a big help, so thanks to everybody, and remember, you folks in Missoula, whether you're individual citizens or organizations, uh, this is your facility, this is your TV station, uh, tell your folks, and this is not fancy, dancy stuff down here. This is just communication. Um, people get a little bit into, you know, this, this outfit has training, you know. Just send your folks over, sign them up for training, let folks make their own programs. And, uh, and, and Russ, maybe uh, count on you to uh, do some uh, organizing of, uh, you know, public access stations like this up in Helena and all over Montana. That's a great service, and I wish we had it here. Um, and, uh, I think that it's time to take a wrap. Uh, uh, Russ, uh, uh, thanks for calling and sticking with it. I enjoyed the conversation. I, I, uh, Thank um, you for inviting me. And, uh, we'll, we'll talk again sometime. Okay. Thanks, okay. and good night to you. Good night.
And uh, Janet, uh, Robido, and to uh, Derek, uh, thanks for coming down and, and sharing with us. Uh, you know, I mean, it, we didn't even get into particulars, which is what uh, a lot of folks need. Mm -hmm. And I just got the wave to cut off. So good night from uh, MCAT. And uh, you're not under the Copper Dome, but you are under the Copper Dome. And we've all been up there. Hang in there. Good night. See you soon. Watch MCAT.